Okay, we're back. We're live. It's uh, noon on a given Monday, and I'm here with Marco Mangelsdorf. Hi, Marco. It's great to talk to you always yet again. Well, just to have Tuan Ma on for a change, even though we love our, our guests uh, we have over the past months, and we've had some great ones. I mean, it's great to be just Tuan Ma again on this Monday <laughs> of February 11th. So thank you so much for having me back, my friend. Absolutely. Energy 808, the cutting edge. So let's let's talk about something about talk about let's talk about to talk about, and that's uh, namely you know the the problem with making Hawaii from an energy point of view um, reliable, having reliable systems, and uh, uh, having resilient systems. There's an awful lot of talk about that. There's so many conferences and so much you see in the newspaper and everybody uh, you know expressing themselves on. The, on the issue, can can you help me define what we're talking about uh, when we when we talk about uh, reliability and uh, uh, um, and uh, re resilience? I'm not be happy to. I mean, the the good buzzwords uh, are the bright baubles of the day in terms of utility planning and power generation seem to uh, be focusing on on R&R, &R, not so much rest and relaxation, but to resiliency or reliability and resilience in terms of what needs to be done, and in my opinion, quite a bit needs to be done, what needs to be done in order to beef up, or if you're a vegetarian, tofu up, the grids <laughs> across our island chain to be able to be more robust and more uh, able to withstand adverse events, whether it's a uh, lava flow like we've had here on the island for a number of months last year, or whether it's adverse weather events like the whole state has been enjoying, enjoying in quotation marks, just over the past couple of days. I mean, there were gusts on the top of Mauna Kea here on this island up to 191 miles an hour wow. over the past 24, 36 hours. Wow. And that, of course, those kind of winds can play havoc with the utility grid in terms of blowing over poles, knocking trees into power lines, yep. and uh, there weren't a small number of people uh, across the state, tens of thousands of people who were without power uh, at any given moment or for hours or longer over the past couple of days. So what needs to be done in terms of making our grids more robust and reliable in terms of staying on and then the resilience part According to our friends at FERC, FERC being the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, they define resilience as, quote, the ability to withstand and reduce the magnitude and or duration of disruptive events, which includes the capability to anticipate, absorb, adapt, and to, and or rapidly recover from an event, close quotation. They use some alliteration there. Anticipate, absorb, and adapt. Mm -hmm. So... Well, it's, you know, it's, grid is, so it sounds to me like uh, um, reliability is at the front end. It's preparing. It's making yourself um, stronger. And resilience is developing systems to recover after, you, after you've had a problem of some kind. Right. So reliability, you, you can um, harden, harden the system, so yeah. to speak, whether, you know, harden uh, an IT system against the likelihood or possibility of a cyber attack or harden the actual physical infrastructure and backbone of utility grids. And I know Hawaiian Electric and the folks at KIUC are putting a priority on doing this, but my great fear is, Jay, my huge fear is that we are living on borrowed time in a sense that last year we had six major weather events cruise on through the Central Pacific. Four of them were hurricane strength, and one of them managed to get up to a Category 5, which is the highest category. So. Sooner or later, one of these one of these hurricanes is going to pull an aniki on Oahu, Maui, Kauai again, the Big Island, uh, as what happened on Kauai in 1991. So, what can we do? Question number one: What do we need to do? Question number two: In a short-term time frame, to beef up, harden our electrical infrastructure so that it won't be catastrophic in terms of the results as the folks on Puerto Rico are still dealing with, which is going to require essentially the, the rebuilding of that grid to the tune of multi-billions of dollars, and where's that money going to come from, mm. so we don't experience what, what Iniki 
wreaked on uh, Kauai in 91 or what a couple hurricanes did to, uh, to, uh, to Puerto Rico in 2017. And, uh, you know, amongst the various priorities that are our uh, legislators and our regulators and the, the, the general public writ large, what priority do they put on increasing the reliability and resiliency of the electric grid versus other societal priorities such as homelessness, education, deferred maintenance of the UH, and on and on and on and on. And my case would be, I would make the case that this should be a high priority item. Well, this is survival. And, this is survival. Yeah. And, and if you don't do this, lives will be lost. Uh, that's the part that escapes me because, uh, I mean, that concerns me. We. We, uh, we have so much discussion about these things, so many organizations and commissions and uh, nonprofits and conferences from hither and yon, and uh, they all come to make the point that, um, you know, we are going to suffer extreme weather. Uh, we better get ready for it. Okay, I know that. You and I know that. I'm not sure the legislature knows that, but you and I know that. So how do we go from there, from that conclusion, which we've already made, to taking some steps? Well, let, let's, let's try it out a little bit right here on the show. Now, narrowing the focus here, we're talking about the electrical grid because we see that as a very high priority, in a way higher than any other priority because of, of the disastrous results if we don't have a working grid. So the question first is, um, you know, I, and I'll assume that not much has been done to really harden it or to develop resiliency systems. So the question is, what is likely, most likely, again, a priorities list, what is most likely to happen? Well, it's, it's not, uh, you know, climate change in the sense of sea level rise. We have to deal with that later. That's not a priority right now. What's a priority right now, especially in the year of El Nino, is extreme weather. And we've seen it, you know, every day, including this polar vortex thing, including, in my opinion, these high winds. So the, the question is, um, what are we likely to suffer? And you pointed out that we likely to suffer another in Iki and worse, of, worse of course, in, in uh, Honolulu. Um, and what can we do to harden the system and to make the systems in general more, more resilient? So if I gave you a checkbook for a billion dollars, Marco, where would you start in, uh, in, in taking these affirmative actions? Well, I'm glad you asked that question, Jay, because my response is, that the easiest, in my opinion, one of the easiest and most cost-effective ways to move in the direction where we need to move in is to commit to a, a massive, a massive increase in the in the deployment of battery storage across the board uh, for for the state of Hawaii, because whether you we want to call it distributed energy resources or or DER for short or distributed generation. The idea and the concept of going away from the traditional centralized power hub and spoke model, which is very Edisonian, going back more than 100 years, where you have a central power plant sending transmission distribution lines far hither and yon to provide power to people, sometimes hundreds on the mainland, thousands of miles away, that that effectively over the past 20 years has been uh, shifting and metamorphosizing to a distributed generation where you have small power plants on people's homes, power plants on, pe on, on the roofs of people's businesses. So by adding energy storage both uh, to these nanogrids or making nanogrids for people's homes and also energy storage for bigger facilities, whether it's universities or shopping centers, that you are creating uh, a much different architecture, not just of the future, but hopefully of, of, t of today, of the present, where if a particular area of the grid is hard hit, infrastructure is taken out, poles are down, power plants are damaged, then there will be at least other parts of that grid that will be effectively micro-gridded or nano-gridded to be able to provide power to those people within that circuit or even possibly export that power to other parts of the grid that are undamaged. So to answer your question in a nutshell, batteries, 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 batteries. And that is what we can do in the near term as in not the next five to ten years, but the next 12, 24, 36 months. So one of the ways that our government and our society can support that would be 
to get a bill to Governor David Ike by the end of this legislative session, which would have a separate state tax credit for the addition, supporting the addition of battery storage to existing renewable energy systems. And yeah. the same bill failed in 2018, 2017, and 2016, never made out of conference committee. So I'm yet again holding my breath and lighting my puja sticks and my incense that maybe, just maybe, there will be success this time because... We just don't have the time to waste, in my opinion, and battery storage exponentially increased in terms of deployment will get us closer to where we want to be in terms of a greater and more robust electric grid on our isolated, for our isolated island grids. Okay, so let me unpack some of that. Um, you know, first of all, um, gee, I, I'm with you on the time frame. We've got to do it as soon as possible. I can't for the life of me understand why. Uh, you, you can't uh, get a tax credit when you want to add batteries. It's so obvious that that, that will make the whole thing uh, more resilient. If we add batteries to existing solar facilities, it means that these individual homeowner uh, you know, facilities uh, will be able to stand by themselves when necessary. Otherwise, they won't because uh, the, you know, the, the, no, no sun at night, no electrical power. Um, not only that, but Big batteries are bigger than we were thinking before. So in order to do that, you've got to spend the money. The tax credit, you know, is obviously is going to affect conduct. It's going to encourage people to do that, uh, even if they wouldn't do it otherwise. It's going to say the government has considered this and cares about you and cares about making us more resilient. Um, so here, uh, have a few bucks, have a tax credit, uh, get, some, get some storage. Um, so that should happen right away. And, and for the life of me, I don't understand why it hasn't happened already. Um, the, other, the other aspect, though, is that only deals with the, uh, you know, the single-family residents and possibly a community solar kind of installation. Um, are you talking about storage for the larger utility-scale solar farms as well? Uh, you haven't really identified whether you know, your suggestion covers that, does it? Well, the new solar projects, which have been, uh, which are now going through, will be going through the approval process. Seven of them, I believe, that Hawaiian Electric announced not too long ago, which will have to uh, meet uh, PUC scrutiny. All of those systems, two on this island, two on Maui, and I believe three on Oahu, all of those would have utility scale solar, as in multi megawatts of PV arrays, and. Uh, utility scale megawatt hours of, of battery storage. So uh, pretty much every new substantial commercial, oh, not commercial, but utility scale PV uh, or wind for that matter, uh, virtually all of them I think going in from henceforth will most likely have substantial amount of battery storage to do two important things. One is to minimize the surplus renewable energy power being fed into the grid when the grid doesn't need it, which is, let's say, during midday hours because there's already a fair amount of solar, and two, would allow that energy stored during daylight hours to be discharged to the grid when people need it the most, when the grid needs, needs it the most, which is typically between 5 p.m. to 9 or 10 p.m., so what we're seeing with these new projects is battery storage is parting is has become thanks in no small part to KIUC leading the way several years ago by pioneering this in our state, but has become the way to go. So no, I'm not I'm not dismissing it at all. It's a very important piece of the puzzle. But I'm thinking more, you know, from my perspective as a small to midland solar contractor that uh, there is a tremendous market potential for retrofitting the 80 plus thousand rooftop solar systems on people's homes and businesses with battery storage. Well, let me, let me return to the, uh, the larger, uh, the, you know, utility scale uh, for a moment. So, I mean, I don't have solar on my house, okay? And a lot of people don't. I mean, there's, there's a lot of people who do, but still more people don't. And they rely on the utility to provide electrical power. So you have, you have an issue here, and you talked about the wind knocking down the power lines and all this. So you could have some great solar and great storage and utility scale solar uh, facilities. Um, but what happens when the power lines uh, get knocked down? It doesn't mean much to me. I, now I don't have power because the power lines aren't there. Uh, how can we make um, the system more reliable uh, when, when it's, it's, not, 
It's not that I have it in my house. I don't have it in my house. I rely on the utility. How can we make the system as it affects me uh, more reliable? So I understand your, your, your great question, Jay. So let's assume that it's not a total worst case scenario, which is that Jay Fidel's home has had power poles knocked down to the right and to the left, and you are physically disconnected from the grid. Let's just assume that that worst case scenario did not happen. Let's assume that you are in a circuit which hasn't been directly hit in terms of power poles being knocked down feeding that circuit. So where we are moving towards, I believe, and this will take some time, but we're moving towards where there are these entities called aggregators that can take and are taking the X number of rooftop solar plus storage systems in a given but on a given island and offering the so-called bulk services or grid services of those PV plus storage to the utility operator where your neighbor or your neighbor two houses down or three houses down, let's say you've got a whole bunch of people in your neighborhood who have PV plus storage, it's conceivable, and again, I'm not on the cutting edge in terms of the engineering on this, but it's conceivable conceptually that you could have the J. Fidel neighborhood or block that would be standalone, could stand alone as a microgrid by you essentially taking advantage of, for, for, for remuneration, uh, but taking advantage of and benefiting from your neighbors having solar plus storage. Yeah, well, that sounds like that, a great idea. It's like compart compartmentalization in a ship or a submarine uh, where you limit the damage uh, by, yeah. by having separate compartments. And I'd be, I'd be uh, interested in all in favor of that. However, uh, we, we're not doing it now, and uh, we don't have a system to do it, and it hasn't been worked out on a regulatory level. Um, and uh, gee whiz, uh, you think we could do that by the close of the, of the session this year? I don't think so. Uh, perhaps not by the close of the session, but we, I know for a fact that Hawaiian Electric uh, is moving forward with some uh, with a program to be able to dip their toe in the water and, and then their whole foot and then their whole leg and then their whole body, the whole eco body, so to speak, where they are working with these aggregators who have proposed providing various services and benefits to HECO to be able to have HECO tap into the benefits that these individual PV plus storage homes and businesses could and will provide to Hawaiian Electric over time. So this is, uh, as far as I know, I don't know of anybody else in the country that's doing this stuff. It sounds like I mean, a great other, idea, Marco. It really does. And uh, it's, it's, it's logical, it's consistent, and at least theoretically it's doable. Uh, so <clears throat> I'm encouraged to hear that uh, Hawaiian Electric is looking into it. We're going to take a short break, Marco, and when we come back, I'd like to talk about uh, whether it's necessary, either on a single family or small installation or on a utility scale installation, uh, to re-anchor, rebuild, um, you know, uh, strengthen, strengthen uh, the uh, supports and structures around, around the solar p panels and for that matter around the batteries so that they can better deal with a storm. When we come back, let's tackle that. And for now, let's take a one minute break. Marco Mangelsdorf, ProVision Solar. Hey, aloha. My name is Andrew Lanning. I'm the host of Security Matters Hawaii, airing every Wednesday here on Think Tech Hawaii, live from the studios. I'll bring you guests. I'll bring you information about the things in security that matter to keeping you safe, your coworkers safe, your family safe, to keep our community safe. Uh, we want to teach you about those things in our industry that you know may be a little outside of your experience. So please join me because security matters. Aloha. Aloha, I'm Yukari Kunisue, the host of Konnichiwa Hawaii, Japanese talk show on ThinkTech Hawaii. Konnichiwa Hawaii is all Japanese broadcast show and it's streamed live on ThinkTech at 2 p.m. every other Monday. Thank you so much for watching our show. We look forward to seeing you then. I'm Yukari Kunisue. Mahalo. Energy 808, the cutting edge. We're here with Marco Mangelsdorf, who joins us uh, by remote from uh, ProVision Solar and Hilo. And we're talking about uh, uh, reliability and resilience in the case of, uh, in the case of uh, extreme weather, which is probably coming. Um, so, uh, you know, uh, we, we did a show uh, a couple months ago about Puerto Rico 
And we had some guy who had studied it in, in Washington. He was with an NGO in Washington. And he had these photographs of these large um, solar farms in Puerto Rico where half of the solar farm in each case would be installed by one, one company and one type of installation system and the other another kind. And, and what was remarkable about it is that uh, one kind of installation system was way better than the other. And you would see that the wind tore up half of it and left the other half alone, so much so that the other half was actually still working after Maria had done her damage. Um, so what it shows to me is that you can have systems that are really strong and systems that are not so strong, and you've got to make sure that they're strong. And so my question to you is, do, do we need, either on the rooftops of uh, single-family homes um, or on larger uh, solar facilities, do we need to go through and make an analysis to see which ones are the strong ones and which ones need, um, you know, need to be shored up somehow? Well, here you're talking about, you know, design, construction, building practices, and what the requirements of the, what we call the authority having jurisdiction, or AHJ for short, mm -hmm. what their requirements are in terms of constructing uh, a PV system, whether it's a ground mount, we're using thousands of modules, or whether it's 10 modules on someone's home. So I, I can't comment all that well on what happened in Puerto Rico other than, you know, there are microclimates, of course, that uh, you could have a wind speed of X in one part of the island and then maybe just two miles away it's going to be X plus 50 percent. So I don't know why some PV arrays took off in the wind and others stayed put. But as long as, I mean, look, the, the, the reality is that if you get a, a wind speed of, a, you know, a gust of 191 miles an hour like we saw on Mauna Kea, uh, there's not a whole lot that can be done in terms of keeping stuff battened down for, with typical construction practices. So the question is, you know, the, the more you require of, of businesses like mine and engineering companies to have super, super hard and hardened PV arrays, it's going to drive up the cost. So y you can't necessarily and you shouldn't design for the, the worst case scenario of 175, 191 mile an hour winds for all applications because that would drive up the cost you know, to to be cost prohibitive. So there's got to be some type of modus vivendi here between what is what are good standard engineering practices and building practices to keep the vast majority of of, of PV systems on roofs versus spending a tremendous amount of money to 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 harden it to such an nth degree that it becomes cost prohibitive. And you know, as as we tell people. If your roof takes off in a big wind, well, the solar system is, is going to take off with it, you know. So the, you can only design and, and build for, for so much before you have to take a step back and, and decide what is, what is cost effective, what's reasonable and prudent. That's probably kind of a, not the, the most satisfying answer for you, Jay, but that's the best, the best I can come up with right now. Okay, well, what bounces around in my head is that every year I have to take my car in for a safety, uh, a safety sticker inspection. <clears throat> and that, you know, of course, it makes it safer for me, but it also makes it safer for the other guy on the highway. And when you have the roof coming off or the panels flying around, um, it's not only that you're losing the panels of the roof in your house, but, uh, you know, you, your neighborhood is at risk as well. And so I, I really wonder whether we are ultimately going to have to deal with a, an inspection system where somebody goes out and makes sure that the way the thing is anchored, it's not likely or less likely to fly off. Uh, I know that hasn't happened yet. We, we don't have such a system. We rely on the, um, I guess, the license of the installer um, and the insurance of the installer in case it all flies off. Um, but I think uh, ultimately if we want to have real reliability here, and I hate to suggest the need for government action because, you know, that's always a layer of bureaucracy. Um, but at some point along the way, it probably would behoove us to have some system to make sure that what's on there even if it was well installed at the beginning, it's still well installed and uh, right. it's not likely to fly off. Uh, and after five or ten years, and we're entering that, you know, that area of time now after recent installations, uh, we do need somebody to look at it. And without some kind of mm, you know, system, nobody will look at it, and that's re regrettable. But I'll let you go to one other thing before we close up because we had two words that we were dealing with. One was reliability. We've talked about that. Um, and the other, the other is um, resiliency, which means um, coming back 
after right. after some kind of disaster. So again, the same question: What action points would you suggest right now to improve our resiliency after extreme weather, especially about the grid? Well, I'll just uh, you know reiterate that um, having an exponential increase in, in battery deployment uh, makes a tremendous amount of sense for me. Uh, I'm also uh, encouraged that I know Hawaiian Electric and KIUC take uh, disaster planning very, very seriously. Uh, and I think uh, my friend Jay Ignacio, who just recently retired from uh, from Helco after, gosh, uh, 12 years, well, 11 years at the helm, that, I mean, he, he did a fantastic job. He and his crew did a fantastic job. So I, I firmly believe that uh, that. The utility companies here get it, and, and they, they work closely with each other, and you'll see Nico trucks on, uh, on the Big Island sometimes, and you'll see Hiko trucks on Kauai. So there's, there's uh, you know, the, the attitude of we're all in this canoe together and we've got to help each other out. So uh, I think, uh, you know, I, I give us a lot of credit, give our utility friends a lot of credit for doing what they have been doing in terms of preparedness, running drills, having uh, incident management teams ready to go, so that uh, that really helps. Yeah, <clears throat> I absolutely agree. We've had a, we've had a number of discussions with Hawaiian Electric uh, with respect to you know incidents of bad weather over over recent times, and they do have uh, tremendous systems where <clears throat> every everybody in the company is deployed uh, to try to get things back together again as quickly as possible. And I think uh, that's it's notable and it's it's worth mentioning uh, that we've had experience with bad weather. And they have had experience in, in building their um, resiliency systems uh, to put things back together again. Um, but who knows, you know, how, how serious, um, you know, these storms will be. Who knows uh, how much more serious they will be than the storms we've had and the damage we've had. And so uh, you, can, you can only make a model based on reasonable expectations. You can't expect uh, 191 miles an hour all the time. But, um, but, you know, there are probabilities, and we have to look at the probabilities and figure out what kind of uh, system response we need to have. And I think that is largely within the hands of the utility um, to figure out what to do. In terms of the individual homeowner, uh, what's he going to do? He's, he's gonna, he doesn't have another system in his garage. He's not going to be able to go up on his roof and, and fix it. Um, I guess the important thing for him is to stay connected to the grid which gives him another option in case his solar system and his batteries um, fail for some reason in the extreme weather. So it's right. probably better for him to be connected at the end of the day uh, than completely disconnected because then he won't have that secondary option. Well, I just, you know, sincerely hope, Jay, that uh, we collectively see this for the seriousness of the threat it is, along with the uh, homelessness and other things that stare, up in the, stare us in the face on a more kind of daily basis, and we, we are more proactive than, than lazy in terms of really putting some time and effort and some money, some general fund money, if necessary, to be able to move in the direction of, uh, of making our islands more... Uh, more reliable uh, and more resilient. Yeah, and it's really important. Lives are at stake here. This weather is going to be unforgiving, and we'd better be ready for it and ready to recover afterward. And the legislature has to, and the executive for that matter, government has to pay attention to this. Uh, it, is, it is an issue, as you and I agreed, um, which is paramount, which has to be at the top of the heap. And uh, we, we cannot uh, attend to small issues when we have this huge, large issue that has to be addressed. This session. This session. Anyway, we, we, Michael, what I mean. we, we. We, we. Okay, we got agreement on that. <laughs> <laughs> I'll see you in two weeks, Marco. I look forward to that. I always do. Mahalo Nui, my friend. Aloha. Bye-bye.